It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Let's bring in David Miller, Catalyst Fund's Chief Investment Officer and Senior Portfolio Manager. And let's get right to your buy here. And just we'll do a little tease. Your goodbye is one of those Magnificent Seven stocks that we just heard Anthony talk about. But let's get to your stock that you do like, first of all, and that is Hims and Hers Health. Now, this is an interesting one. It's had a good you know, year to date so far. It came public back in 2019 as part of a DSPAC, um, right? And so let's get to your bull case here. Basically, that it's a grower is your first point. Absolutely. 47% revenue growth, massive revenue growth. Even when the stock was declining, interestingly enough, it was growing incredibly quickly and massive margins. Yeah, and also the company is now profitable, which is something it hadn't been on a regular basis here. So is this something that now it's going to be more consistent in terms of its profitability? Absolutely. So it's one of the few SPACs that I really like. And now that they're profitable, when you're profitable and you have massive margins and you continue growing, and that percentage of their costs that are marketing expenditures continue to decrease, you'll just see that net income continue to grow very rapidly is my anticipation. Now, this company, for those people who aren't familiar with Hims and Hers, they provide men's and women's health products um, online, right? So they exactly. sell them online. Um, we used to see um, pre-pandemic, they had a lot of ads in the subway here in New York City. So that was one of the ways I first got exposed to them. And what is this sort of, what problem are they solving for for customers that you think is unique? I'd say they're solving three huge problems for mm. customers. First is, when you wanted medication in the past, you had to go into a doctor's office. Now, if that were for an embarrassing problem, like an ED or balding or things of that nature, or things where you just don't want to go to the doctor's office, now you can do it on the computer. Two is, you used to actually have to go to the pharmacy to then get that medication. They ship it straight to your home in a couple days. Three is that these medications used to be either very expensive if you paid out of pocket, or you'd have to buy it through insurance and a copay. It's actually cheaper to buy these directly than the cost of the insurance copay. So it's saving you money, and it's saving a lot of time, and it's making life dramatically easier, why you're, which is why you're seeing so much customer adoption. Right. And as always, when we talk about these, though, we got to talk about some of the risks to the potential upside. So if we look in this case, maybe there could be some changing regulation around tel telehealth. And there's also competition from Roe, which is another startup. So let's take the first of these first. What could happen on the regulation front? So there's already been some changes in regulation uh, around the pandemic and when they made it a lot easier to do telehealth. Mm -hmm. Now, that hasn't affected hims and hers yet because they're generally uh, medications that are easy to get, very little in the way of side effects. They're not like uh, significant antidepressants or painkillers that are addictive. Uh, there are things that pose little risk, but that could always change. Uh, second to the point with Roe, Roe's a, a direct competitor. They're, they're both great services. Potentially one will do better than the other, but this is also a very big space and they're both solving a huge problem in removing the need to go to the doctor's office or the pharmacy or pay more money. So when you can solve all three of those problems and make life easier for people, there's a good chance they can both do well. Interesting, all right, now let's get to your goodbye. and. This one, I'm, I'm going to venture to say, this is a little bit of a risky call, perhaps, because it's a very popular stock. We're talking about NVIDIA, but there are people now who are talking about maybe it's gone too far too fast. So first of all, you say that you know it's already growing a lot, and it's getting ever bigger. So is it going to be tougher for it to grow going forward at the same pace? So there's two different issues. Will it continue yeah. to grow? Will the net income grow rapidly? Yeah, I think the company is going to grow very rapidly, both on the top line and the bottom line. The real risk here to people who decide to own NVIDIA is they're paying 25 times revenue for a company that has a $2 trillion valuation, roughly. There's never been a company in history that's justified that type of valuation at that type of size. You have to really think that NVIDIA is going to be the largest company on Earth to justify that. Now, will they be? It's certainly possible. But are there less risky ways that you can get a better risk-adjusted return? I think so. And this is an interesting point that you make as well, or back up real quick, that semiconductors tend to be cyclical, tends to be a commodity business. Now, NVIDIA's argument is that the complexity of the chips that they're producing has decommodified it to some extent. Do you not buy that argument? 
I do buy their argument. Okay. It's clearly true. There's enormous demand for their chips right now. Right now, they have a game changer chip. Nobody in history uh, before would pay a quarter million dollars for a chip. There's no question uh, that their company is doing incredibly well, and they're going to continue to do well in the near future. The question is, will that continue indefinitely? Mm. Historically, you've always had boom and bust cycles in semiconductors, chip makers. It's getting priced now like that's over. There's never going to be another company that's going to compete directly with NVIDIA, and that remains to be seen. Yeah, and then finally, this kind of sums up what you alluded to a couple of times, that it's valued as though it's going to be the biggest company, as though it's never going to see any competition, et cetera. Exactly. That, that's the big question. If they could maintain this lead that they have indefinitely, sure, they're definitely going to be worth it. But is there a reason to think five, ten years from now, uh, other people can't catch up and they're going to have incredibly high unusual margins forever? My uh, thought is less likely. Gotcha. And then the risk to the downside case here is that, in particular, that what they just announced, that Blackwell chip, that it is going to be tough to compete against. Yeah, and it absolutely will be. And to clarify, I'm not saying NVIDIA is a short. Gotcha. I'm saying I'd avoid it. Uh, it's certainly possible that uh, AI will be the biggest thing ever, and it very likely will be huge. The, the question is, is it worth $2 trillion today? Right, and maybe there's other ways to play it, as you mentioned. Just real quickly here, are you long hymns and hers? Yes, I, I am. But you don't have a position in Don't it. have a position one way or the other in it. Okay, gotcha. So let's sum up what you're telling investors here. Basically, you say you would buy hymns and hers given its growth, it costs the tipping point into profitability, and it creates amazing value for customers. On the other side, you say avoid NVIDIA given that maybe it's priced for perfection here and will not live up to the very, very lofty expectations being priced in. Really appreciate it, David. Thank you. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern.